Hello and welcome to Physical Attraction, the Teot Wauki specials, where we'll be examining the end of the world, one apocalypse at a time. And survive while there's people crying, people dying everywhere around. Hello and welcome to this Teot Wauki special of Physical Attraction. Now I need to do a little bit of housekeeping to explain the next few episodes of Teot Wauki. So what I'm going to be talking about is the various different kinds of ecological or environmental catastrophe. And under this big umbrella, we have number two on my list of potential apocalypses. So in many ways, what humans are doing to the environment should be looked at holistically as a whole. You can't make too many arbitrary dividing lines that still make sense. So for example, deforestation, cutting down the Amazon, it contributes to habitat loss, which can cause species to go extinct. But as trees absorb carbon dioxide, deforestation and changing land use in general contributes to carbon emissions by removing a natural sink of carbon. It messes up the carbon cycle, and this has an impact on climate change. And climate change, the rapid kind that we're engaging in, rather than the natural kind that takes place over centuries and thousands of years. Climate change also destroys habitats and puts incredible strain on ecosystems. So you can see that all of these things are very fundamentally interlinked. But I know given how complex and important this issue is that I'm going to spend a very long time describing it. So in a way, I'm going to make the same kind of compromise that historians have to make all the time. Discretizing history, splitting it up into little chunks, that's an arbitrary choice we make as humans, as historians. Dividing lines are rarely easy to draw as we'd like them to be. So you can't really understand what's going on in the Roman Empire without understanding the system of the Roman Republic, and the Greek civilizations before that, and so on. As podcaster Mike Duncan put it, it really is all the same big story, but we can't make podcasts called The History of the Human Race two million years ago to the present. Not that people haven't tried. So for the sake of clarity, I'm going to split the ecological and environmental catastrophe into two parts. The first part, which is this part you're listening to now, will focus on pollution, species extinction, and scarcity of resources, what you might call a general ecological collapse. And the second part is going to focus on perhaps the most famous environmental problem we have, and the most famous aspect of this, and that will be climate change. So as is always the case, I can only possibly begin to scratch the surface of the topics that I'm talking about here. Naturally, this show is limited by my own knowledge and ability to research things, which means I can quote-unquote cover the whole field of epidemiology in an hour or so. I don't know what I'm missing, that's how limited my knowledge is. But climate change is something I know a bit more about, so inevitably that episode is going to be a pretty mammoth offering. Equally, there are crises in the field of biodiversity that I just won't be aware of because it's not my field. If you know more, get in touch and I can feature this in a future episode, or maybe even interview you on the show. I want this show to be a repository of knowledge for people that they can access that's going to help us all to understand the challenges that are facing us in the world today. So although I've made this arbitrary split just to make things manageable, you should bear in mind that these things are completely interrelated. Climate change has impact on biodiversity and habitat loss. Pollution interplays with climate change. So for example, one of the reasons that climate change has proved so difficult to measure is the amount of aerosol pollution that is currently up in the atmosphere. This includes things like nitrous oxide and sulphur dioxide that go up into making smog, the effects of which can be complicated in the atmosphere. So scientists actually think that the net result of this smog is to block out the sun and cool the earth down, which means that in a smogless world, we would have had more warming due to CO2 than we've actually observed. So everything is interlinked, and often in ways we barely appreciate, or we don't realise until it's already too late. And it's good to keep that in mind. So I think the overarching theme of all of this is going to be sustainability. Because this is what it all comes down to. The way we live now is not sustainable. Whether it's extracting finite resources from the earth with no way to replenish them, whether it's polluting the landscape and killing off the other species we share the earth with, 
whether it's carbon emissions that will, if unchecked, eventually lead to climate catastrophe. It all comes down to the fact that we can't keep on doing what we're doing. We need to be smarter, cleaner, greener, or we will risk our survival. Of course, the irony is that this is all just a consequence of why we're so dominant as a species. Homo sapiens is, in some sense, a victim of its own success. After all, what is so special about us? We can't run faster, we can't jump further, we have no scary claws or teeth. In a fair fight compared to many top predators in the animal kingdom, we'd lose every single time. But it's not a fair fight, because we're smart enough to understand and to change the rules of the game. Have you ever had that sudden moment of revelation? Perhaps you're sitting in your room or staring out of the bus window absentmindedly. It's not even really a revelation, because that implies something is being revealed to you. This is more of just a reminder, a remembering, a recollection. That moment when you suddenly realise that nearly everything around you has been put there by humans. It's all been pulled from the earth, from the bowels and the rocks below, or from the ocean, or from the animals. It's undergone some energy-intensive manufacturing process, usually, and then it's been transported to you. You might not even understand what it is that these things are made of, what it is that they used to be in nature. But the roads that the bus travels on, the seat underneath you, the stylish artifice of your clothes, the machine in your hand that dispenses its blue days and its black nights, all of these things have been pulled from the earth. Some of them contain a wide and bewildering array of substances that you might not even have heard of. Many of them are made and manufactured in places you will never go, by people you will never see, with raw materials extracted from mines that none of us have ever been to. It's crazy when you stop and think about it. For the last billion or so years, the silicon in the chips of the computer I'm using to type this away was happy being sand or rocky ore somewhere. And now, in the last tiny fraction of its life, humans have cruelly snatched it away, tricked it into thinking, transported it across the world several times, and now I'm using it to talk to you. Let's say you spend the day at home, a lazy Sunday. It's perfectly possible, probable even, that most of what you touch is nothing that would exist without humans. Everything is either completely artificial or natural things that we've bent and twisted and harnessed into shape. It's all artificial. Birds can make nests, and bees can make hives to protect themselves from the world, but no creature other than humans has engaged in world-altering geoengineering on such a massive scale to suit our needs, to protect us, to fulfil our desires. And when I think about how strange it is that we have, over so many years, shaped so much of the world to suit our needs, I'm afraid about what the consequences might be. And I'm not convinced that in a hundred, in a thousand years, we'll still be able to live like this throwing away plastic bags, burning fossil fuels for power, eating whatever we want from all over the world, with so many of us living so profligately from the fruits of the earth. But equally, we depend on this process, especially in the West. Most of us are no longer even close to self-sufficient. If the food stops being delivered to the supermarkets, we'd struggle to survive. For all our genius, for all our confidence and hubris, we are living with two life support systems, twin high-maintenance machines the artificial one that we have created, and the natural one that feeds it. But can they sustain each other? The impacts of our massive experiments try to shape the world to be more comfortable for us. Well, they're all around us. Take the biodiversity crisis. We are currently in a mass extinction. Every day, biodiversity is being lost at up to a thousand times the natural rate. The extinction of individual species but also habitat destruction, land conversion for agriculture and development, climate change, pollution and the spread of invasive species, often introduced into unnatural places by humans, are only some of the threats responsible for today's crisis. With the current biodiversity loss, we are witnessing the greatest extinction crisis since dinosaurs disappeared from the planet 65 million years ago. Not only are, so far, these extinctions irreversible, but they pose a threat to food change, ecosystems, and our health and well-being. So coral reefs. 
The services provided by coral reefs may be up to 500 million people being given food, storm protection, jobs, recreation, yet 70% of them are threatened or destroyed, and it seems likely that as the ocean acidifies due to carbon emissions, they will all die soon enough. Of all the species that have been obsessed, they've assessed 52,000 species, and 18,000 of them are considered to be threatened with extinction. Of the world's 5,500 mammals that have been identified, 78 are extinct or extinct in the wild, 188 are critically endangered, 450 are endangered, and 492 vulnerable. Nearly 2,000 of the planet's 6,285 amphibians are in danger of extinction, making them one of the most threatened groups of species known to date. As many as 30 to 50% of all species could be headed towards extinction by the middle of the century. And this isn't a natural occurrence. In fact, 99% of the currently threatened species are at risk from human activities. Now, it's true that species have always gone extinct in the past before, just like the climate has always changed. But often it was over time periods of thousands of years, or else due to transient causes like volcanic eruptions or asteroid strikes that give biodiversity time to flourish again. So when you hear people make this argument that species have always gone extinct and adaptation and survival has always been the case, well, it's true, but you have to view what we're doing as equivalent to the impact of volcanic eruptions or an asteroid strike, because the only times you ever see changes this dramatic on this kind of scale is when something big like that happens. That's why people want to call this era the Anthropocene, the era defined by humans. Species that you'd never expect can be threatened and hunted to extinction by humans. We're not just talking about rare insects that no one's heard of. An example I always think of, one that makes you utterly incredulous really, is the passenger pigeon. So they're called passenger pigeons due to the massive flights they used to take across the sky. And there used to be billions of them in North America. That's not an exaggeration, people estimate that there were billions of them. In 1914, the last passenger pigeon died. From having been one of the most abundant species on the planet, they're now extinct. So this is quoting from the excellent Centre for Biodiversity website with their hard-to-argue-with motto of Life is Good. Quote, A flock of passenger pigeons reported in Ontario in 1866 was described as being a mile wide and 300 miles long and taking 14 hours to pass overhead. And although their species enjoyed a long, long life before they met up with modern Homo sapiens, that contact was all too brief. These remarkable birds, with their iridescent wings, fiery red feet, sparkling skylar eyes, and unmistakably deafening calls, passed from the earth 99 years ago. In the 19th century, the passenger pigeon may have been the most abundant bird in the entire world, with a population believed to have approached 4 billion individuals. As they rested in their forest habitat, Roosting flocks overburdened strong trees to such an extent that some birds had to settle on their flockmates' backs to get some sleep, and thick branches were known to snap under the bird's weight. Flocks in flight were a spectacle without parallel, enormous masses of birds taking on multiple shapes as they twisted and undulated across the firmament. Famed naturalist John James Orburden described these flocks delightfully and dramatically as blackening the skies as by an eclipse. One of the most social land birds, the passenger pigeon also displayed unique, charming behaviours, living in colonies stretching over hundreds of square miles, practising communal breeding, and adept at following a lead pigeon when flying en masse, with flocks almost magically swerving in unison to avoid predators. In fact, these birds should be remembered for their anti-violence stance, since they almost never physically fought with other creatures. The exact causes of the passenger pigeon's extinction are unclear, but massive hunting and persecution were among the most devastating impacts, since the bird was very poorly adapted to escape people. It relied on large numbers, rather than hiding or fleeing, to avoid predators. Its other fatal peril was habitat destruction for agriculture and other development, as humans raised the million acres of hardwood that were needed for the birds to have food and shelter. End quote. So the website named after Obadan the naturalist, uh, they had an article called Why the Passenger Pigeon Went Extinct, and they're even starker about it. They say, quote, 
The professionals and amateurs together outflocked their quarry with brute force. They shot the pigeons and trapped them with nets, torched their roosts, and asphyxiated them with burning sulphur. They attacked the birds with rakes, pitchforks, and potatoes. They poisoned them with whiskey-soaked corn. Learning of some of these methods, Native American tribe Potawatomi leader Pokogon despaired. He said, quote, These outlaws, to all moral sense, would touch a lighted match to the bark of the tree at the base, when with a flash, more like an explosion, the blast would reach every limb of the tree. He wrote of an 1880 massacre, describing how the scorched adults would flee and the squabs would burst open upon hitting the ground. Witnessing this, Pokagon wondered what kind of divine punishment there might be awaiting our white neighbours who have so wantonly butchered and driven from our forests these wild pigeons, the most beautiful flowers of the animal creation of North America. Ultimately, the pigeon's survival strategy, flying in huge predator-proof flocks, proved their undoing. If you're unfortunate enough to be a species that concentrates in time and space, you make yourself very, very vulnerable, says Stanley Temple, a professor emeritus of conservation at the University of Wisconsin. Even as the pigeons' numbers crashed, there was virtually no effort to save them, says Joel Greenberg, a research associate with Chicago's Peggy Nutterbart Museum and the Field Museum. He said people just slaughtered them more intensely. They killed them until the very end. So it would have been difficult to see the passenger pigeon, in its flocks billions strong, as a vulnerable creature, but like the dodo, the passenger pigeon's weakness is a perfect metaphor for innocence lost. The hypersocial birds flocked together and relied on their numbers and collective efforts to survive. In the spring, when the passenger pigeons returned from their winter excursions, they were hunted in their thousands by humans who had gone hungry all winter. Their behaviour was very poorly adapted to how humans would behave. And soon enough, before anyone even really got a handle on the problem, before anyone even stopped to notice what was going on, there were none left. The birds that had once blotted out the sun were gone, extinct. Charles Darwin, the great naturalist who discovered so much about the origin of the species and natural selection, he was famously inspired by a visit to the Galapagos Islands. These islands, by providing isolated environments for species to develop and adapt, they're rich in rare biodiversity. It was his discovery on those islands of the finches that led to so much of his understanding of natural selection. Every island had its own population of finches, with the size and shapes of beaks perfectly adapted to the food source available on the mountain of the island. It was this realisation that the finches may have had a common ancestor, the bird that first flew to these islands, and natural selection has led to such a diversity in the beak forms to adapt to where they lived. It was this idea that helped Darwin and Wallace towards their theory of evolution. Yet the Galapagos Islands are also famous for their giant tortoises. In accordance with the general rule that on islands, creatures often tend towards becoming gigantic or tiny. And when Darwin's voyage on the Beagle was taking place, they left a trail behind them. The empty shells of those delicious giant tortoises. They were a good source of protein. Well, I'll quote from P.D. Smith's review of a book on the subject. He said, quote, The giant tortoises were a captain's dream come true, and as a result, many tortoises spent their last months wandering the decks of the ships, waiting to be eaten. One resourceful tortoise reportedly went missing on board a ship, only to be discovered two years later living in the hold among the casks. End quote. This is not a new phenomenon. Wherever humans have been, life has suffered and extinctions have usually followed. Just ask the woolly mammoth for a start. When humans reached Australasia 45,000 years ago, 23 out of the 24 of the larger species went extinct within the first few centuries. Yuval Noah Harari, in his book Homo sapiens, puts it best. Quote, Were the Australian extinction an isolated event, we could grant humans the benefit of the doubt but the historical record makes Homo sapiens look like an ecological serial killer. End quote. I know that there's a fraction of the audience who's been listening to this hymn to biodiversity, and there's a part of me as well that is essentially ultimately thinking something like this. So what? If a few obscure finches or tortoises or woolly mammoths go extinct, well, it sucks to be them, but we have evolved to be the dominant species. It may be sad that such creatures are lost forever, but we don't mourn the billions of natural extinctions that happened in the past, so why should we mourn those that are happening now? It's a small price to pay for the progress that we've achieved. 
Well, I'm not trying to shame anyone who thinks this way. The fact is that we all look at things from an incredibly anthropocentric point of view. If you don't believe me, consider the cuteness factor. People in general are far more concerned about the prospect that something fluffy or cute like a panda, a penguin, or a polar bear might go extinct, as compared to some obscure species of beetle or species that die off due to overfishing. If we can identify human-like behaviour in animals, then it makes us sympathise and empathise with them more. We value them more, because they resemble humans. And most of us, myself included, we're perfectly happy to eat animals even when it's not necessary for our survival, and even when we know that they live in terrible conditions very often. And of course, all of this has been an incredibly human-centric discussion, hasn't it? We have talked about the end of the world as we know it. This has been the great threat. The collapse of human civilization, even the extinction of our species, may prove beneficial for many other species in the long run, although I doubt there would be many chickens or cows alive as there are today. I do think that it's a tragedy that so many forms of life are under threat, but that's only because I view life as inherently valuable, and I'm still the one assigning value to things. I think most people can see the quiet tragedy in the moment when the last of its kind dies, and the unique body, mind and presence of another creature that evolution has produced is lost to us perhaps forever. But this isn't to show about the end of the world as they know it, even though that may well be very valuable. It's a show about the end of the world as we know it. So why does biodiversity matter from a selfish perspective? Well, for a start, we rely on the bountiful munificence of nature for so many of the things we enjoy. From the silk from spiders to the foods we eat, plants and animals provide us with so much and yet they rely on complex ecosystems to survive and prosper, and over time many of these species come to depend on each other in an intricately interlinked way. Incidentally, on the silk topic, silk may become more important than ever. There's a research group at the university I'm at, the, uh, the Oxford Silk Group, and they're looking into producing similar things to spider silk, because it is, as a natural fabric, quite incredible. It has tensile strength and properties unlike almost anything we can create. And they feel like if they could synthesise it, it could end up being used in all kinds of different industrial applications as well as clothes. Now how they have to do this in practice is uh, quite often extract the silk from spiders, which is a job that might give some of you the willies, but it's uh, an interesting area of research that they might be able to uh, industrialise this natural product of spider silk that is better than so much of what humans have come up with. So we have so many gifts from nature, but They've grown up to depend on this complex ecosystem that's very interlinked. So consider, for example, that many plants, up to a third of all species, require animals to pollinate them, which is why the colony collapse disorder that's killing bees is such a terrifying prospect. So there was this discovery ten years ago uh, that's attributed to a man called Dave Hackenberg, who found that the bees were disappearing. They weren't dying, they were just disappearing. So there used to be plagues that would leave big piles of dead bees, but colony collapse disorder left the hives completely empty, so some bloggers called it the bee rapture. The eeriness and the fact that we depend on the way that bees and other pollinators pollinate plants to survive means that this was far more obvious that, and direct than many other examples of biodiversity loss, and it led to a lot of press attention for this story compared to others. And it turned out, yes, of course, this was at least in part a human phenomenon. There was a type of pesticide called neonicotinoids that were implicated in making the bees more vulnerable to a specific parasite that was killing them off. Recently, colony collapse disorder has shown some signs of slowing down, and some studies showed that with the rate of death decreasing, the populations are recovering. Since bees can reproduce quickly, they're less vulnerable to total extinction than big, slowly reproducing animals like pandas and the ban on many neonicotinoids has helped the populations to recover. So this is one apocalypse that seems less likely, at least for now. And it's good news, really, because this is telling us about how humans can change our behaviour to head off ecological catastrophes, even if they are of our own making. But biodiversity is essential to almost all systems on Earth, and a third of plant diversity is expected to disappear by 2050. Today there are 80,000 edible plants on Earth, but only 150 of them are cultivated. Climate regulation and crop pollination, these are natural global systems that rely on biodiversity. 
When you only cultivate high yield crops with monocultures, you have a decrease in the biodiversity and the ecosystems that depend on them. The soil gets degraded because there aren't the other plants around to help fertilise it. And when you consider that the strain that our demands and our destructiveness put on ecosystems, it's a miracle that they're as resilient as they have been. We can't take it for granted forever. Even when I was just researching this, there was a very interesting article that was published in The Guardian which was about the abundance of flying insects. And uh, they gathered data from nature reserves across Germany, but they're saying that perhaps it has implications all over the world where agriculture dominates the landscape. And they found that the abundance of flying insects has fallen by about three quarters just over the last 25 years. So the article says, quote, Insects are an integral part of life on Earth as both pollinators and prey for other wildlife, and it was known that some species, such as butterflies, were declining. But the newly revealed scale of the losses to all insects has prompted warnings that the world is on course for ecological Armageddon, with profound impacts on human society. So we don't know what would happen with all of these insects disappearing, species being wiped out, ecosystems being changed, the balance being shifted, but it's unlikely to be very good for us. There are, of course, other reasons to value biodiversity as well. So, for example, I recently saw a pitch from a group of scientists in the zoology department at my university. They were talking about how fascinated they were by a rare Hawaiian mollusk that had extraordinary regenerative powers. The creature was capable of recovering from all kinds of injuries. There are tiny marine animals known as snail fur, or hydrocetina. They look a little bit like troll dolls with their furry heads that are used for catching tasty morsels that float by in the ocean. But they're very special. When fish bite these heads off, the heads themselves can regenerate. Scientists have observed stem cells from the creature literally flow to the wound where its head was bitten off and repair the damage. There is an African mouse that can repair and regenerate itself at an incredible rate. Any one of these creatures could provide the invaluable genetic material for information for scientists and medics. With billions of years to optimise, nature may be capable of producing far greater solutions to the problems that humans find than we can. Just look at photosynthesis. By killing species, we are destroying information that could prove immensely valuable to humans in the future, especially now that CRISPR and Cas9 have made genome editing so much easier, as we talked about in our episode on the singularity. What if we need to find a new kind of biofuel, or a new kind of food to feed a growing population? Many projections for feeding the growing population, as distasteful as you might find it, rely on us getting a hell of a lot of our protein from insects. But if you've just killed the last equivalent of a cash cow in the insect world, you're out of luck. We know that ecosystems rely on biodiversity to thrive, and as clever as we might think we are, we still owe so much to the natural ecosystems that are around us. There is a theory of the Earth as Gaia, an integrated ecosystem self-regulating. In some ways it makes a lot of sense. Look at the plants which produce oxygen from carbon dioxide, and the animals which produce carbon dioxide from oxygen. Symbiosis is the phenomenon where two creatures depend on each other. Consider the goby fish and the shrimp. The shrimp digs a burrow into the sand, and both of the organisms live in that burrow. Because the shrimp is almost blind, the goby fish touches the shrimp to warn it when a predator is near. This is just one of the billions of symbiotic relationships, relationships that we understand well, and relationships that we have no idea about. Like it or not, we're still an animal. We still depend on this complex web of ecosystems, and if we continue to short-sightedly smash up parts of it, we may well be setting ourselves up for a world of trouble. Beyond biodiversity, there are other looming ecological catastrophes that should keep us all up at night. There was a recent study that linked 9 million deaths, one in six deaths in the world, to pollution. This mostly happens in developing countries, in, uh, in Africa, in India, in China, where the air regulation standards aren't so good. But the fact is, it happens all over the world, and it's very difficult to say for sure. It could well be that scientists are underestimating how many deaths can be attributed to pollution, because we don't know to what extent they cause the deaths from things like cancer. For example, there are studies in the realm of ecological catastrophe that show that at the rate we're going, we can only continue farming for another 60 years. Your children might live in a world where farming is impossible. The issue is topsoil degradation. The United Nations released a very alarming study describing the impact that modern industrialised farming is having on the landscape. 
a third of the planet's land is severely degraded, and fertile soil is being lost at a rate of 24 billion tonnes a year. Although sub-Saharan Africa is the worst affected, and soil degradation and therefore competition over the remaining fertile land has already exacerbated wars in the region, even in Europe a billion tonnes of topsoil is lost annually due to these destructive agricultural practices. Since the fertile uppermost layer of topsoil that's good for growing takes over a thousand years to just regenerate three centimetres, if we continue along this road, it's going to be increasingly difficult to feed a growing population, even as our agricultural technology expands. Food demand is projected to increase by 50% over the next 50 years, but the land that's currently farmed may decline in productivity by up to 30% due to the soil being degraded. To put it even more starkly, by 2050, if current trends continue, there may only be a quarter of the farmable land per person compared to 1960. Some of this productivity gap can be made up with technology, but when we continue to rely on technological revolutions to save us from our own unsustainable lifestyles in so many different fields of endeavour, we're setting ourselves up for a fall somewhere. Somewhere the technology won't be able to keep up. Somewhere there's going to be a problem. And this is all because of unsustainable agricultural practices, really. Destroying soil is nothing new, and in fact it, we should know better because it's led to civilizational collapse in the past as well. Given this, it's surprising that it's a problem that's not discussed as often as you think of for a potentially existential threat. This is via the National Geographic. Quote, Modern examples of the impact of soil erosion are well known. The Dust Bowl in the American and Canadian prairies, the erosion of China's Loess Plateau, the famine in Africa's Sahel. Ancient societies also reaped what they sowed when it came to their farming practices. Quote, the Romans still ploughed themselves out of business, as did the Greeks and the Easter Islanders, says David Montgomery, who studies topography at the University of Washington in Seattle, and is the author of Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations. A Time magazine article on the topic has explained how human practices are leading to degraded agricultural soils. It says, quote, Soil is being lost at a rate between 10 and 40 times the rate at which it's naturally replenished. Soil is a living material. If you hold a handful of soil, there will be more microorganisms there than the number of people who have ever lived on the planet. These microbes recycle organic material, which underpins the cycle of life on Earth, and they also engineer the soil on a tiny level to make it more resilient and better at holding onto water. Microbes need carbon for food, but carbon is being lost from the soil in a number of ways. Simply put, we take too much from the soil, and we don't put enough back. Whereas the classic approach would have been to leave stubble in the field after harvest, this is now often being burnt off, which can make it easier to grow the next crop, or it's being removed and used for animal feed. Second, carbon is lost by too much disturbance of the soil by overplowing and the misuse of certain fertilisers. And the third problem is overgrazing. If there are too many animals, they eat all the plant growth, and one of the most important ways of getting carbon into the soil is through photosynthesis. In our episode on Malthus, we talked about how Norman Borlaug, the Green Revolution, and our ability to, for example, widespread deploy chemical fertilisers to feed the population, has helped us feed a population that was growing exponentially. And this headed off Malthus's fears of famine. But as we mentioned there, the Green Revolution might also have unintended consequences, such as reducing the biodiversity of the crops that are used, rendering them more vulnerable to diseases or changing environmental conditions. The topsoil degradation may be another unintended consequence. By intensively farming land and artificially pumping fertilisers into the soil, we may be destroying other nutrients and microbial action at a faster rate than nature can replenish them. Maybe we can find a technological solution, if we understand soil better and could perhaps modify the microorganisms that regulate it at the moment to replenish it more quickly. The fertilisers and agricultural techniques of the future might not be so destructive. But relying on such breakthroughs to even be possible, this is a risky game to play with our futures. And this links to another interrelated crisis which also owes a lot to the unsustainable practices of humans. The more degraded soil gets, the less capable it is of holding water, and the more water you need to use in irrigation because the soil doesn't hold it for long enough. When the soil can't hold water, 
it flows directly through the water table to the sea, contributing to sea level rise. It may be the case that up to half of the sea level rise that's been observed in some aquacultural regions is actually due to this runoff from irrigation. So as soil degrades, there's going to be an even bigger pressure on freshwater stocks. One in six people in the world today is water stressed, meaning that they don't have sufficient access to drinking water. Water stress is only getting worse. The demands for fresh water continue to increase, but on the whole, we've done nothing large scale enough to really affect the supply, which after all comes mostly from the sun evaporating water from the oceans onto the land. Of the world's major aquifers, that is gravel and sand filled underground reservoirs, 21 out of 37 are receding, from India and China to the United States and France. The Ganges Basin in India is depleting due to population and irrigation demands by an estimated 6.3 centimetres every year. J. Famiglietti, senior water scientist at NASA, has warned that the water table is dropping all over the world. There's not an infinite supply of water. Changing climate and precipitation patterns are at least partially responsible. And like the case for topsoil, human demands are now getting to the point where we cannot expect natural processes to compensate in time. And it's well documented that water stress leads to wars. Let's talk about war for a minute. There are several reasons there are fewer wars in the modern era, by and large. I don't want to diminish the suffering of anyone involved in conflicts today. War remains this terrible, brutal scourge on humanity. But there are far fewer wars than there used to be. And a major reason for this is the Pax Atomica. Nuclear weapons have meant that big powers can't go to war with each other. At least, not nearly as often. But the main reason for wars throughout time immemorial, is the following. Those people over there have some shiny thing, and I want to take it. But that's not how wars work so much in the modern world. There is no longer too much economic sense in plunder. Part of this is that so much of the wealth is intangible. If you invaded London and occupied the square mile, the city, the financial services district that is at the heart of so much of the country's wealth, you wouldn't own that wealth. Instead, the financial markets would probably crash and you'd lose it all, as well as not being able to sell or use those resources yourself to generate wealth. And even in places that are wealthy due to their huge natural resources, the cost of war is probably prohibitive. As I write this, oil is worth $50 a barrel, and Iraq is producing 5 million barrels of oil a day. That means that the oil, not including the cost to extract or refine it, is worth $91 billion a year. But the Iraq war has cost more than $2 trillion, and may end up costing $6 trillion when you consider the benefits that must be paid to the soldiers. The point being that if you interpret it as a straightforward war to seize oil production and keep it, which it wasn't, it's still not worth it. There is no longer much value in going to war just to take another person's stuff and enrich yourself that way. For one, you can't get away with it. For a second thing, there's not stuff that's worth the expense of war to take. But, I mean, that is the case, at least not with natural resources the way they're currently priced and valued. But in the future, will there be wars fought over fresh water supply? Water wars might seem like a hypothetical part of a future dystopian world, where the population has vastly increased and order has been screwed up and we've screwed up the environment beyond recognition as well. But of course, it's not the Mad Max world of the future. It's already here. To quote from the analysis of the National Interest magazine, Quote, water stress acts as an accelerant, increasing the likelihood of conflict. Moreover, water scarcity fueled instability can have dangerous security implications for wider geographic regions. Take Syria as an example. Between 2006 and 2010, the country was hit hard by drought, which wiped out rural livelihoods for many and caused significant internal displacement all across the country. Internal displacement, in turn, helped stir up a pot that boiled over into an all-out civil war in Syria, eventually spreading to Iraq. Over the last two years, ISIS has viewed water access and control as a primary strategic objective of their campaign, and they've commandeered hydroelectric dams, irrigation canals, reservoirs, pipelines, and other water infrastructure to cement their territorial gains. And this is a further point for environmentalism from an anthropocentric point of view. Even if all you care about is humans, human lives, and human suffering, Sleepwalking to ecological disaster is terrible for all of us. If this happens, there will be more wars, there will be more conflicts over the scarce resources. 
we will have to devote ever-increasing efforts to mere survival. We won't have access to the things we take for granted and depend on to live, as millions in the world today do not have access to these things. Technology may come to the rescue, of course, and, for example, a widespread campaign of conservation and desalination could provide more water for people, although it would come at an energetic cost. But I don't believe technology will find it easy to improve on nature, and certainly not at the same scale, certainly not at the same cost. People talk about, for example, cloning meat and growing it in factory labs, but I don't see this as being cheaper than traditional farming for a very long time. If it ever does become cheaper, it will be because we've triggered this ecological catastrophe that has made living off the land so much more difficult. This is really just a small snapshot of the various environmental catastrophes that could occur. I've only begun to scratch the surface on this issue, but I want to end with the story of an environmentalist and a rather bizarre theory that might have some sense to it. So James Lovelock is a fascinating scientist. He worked at NASA for many years, and he was one of the first people to detect high concentrations of chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, in the atmosphere. And that was important because they were later discovered to be the main culprits behind the hole in the ozone layer. The chemical reactions that these CFCs are involved in deplete ozone faster than almost anything else. Incidentally, the CFCs and the ozone problem are really some of the most promising examples of humanity's responses to pollution and our impact on the environment. The most harmful chemicals were banned, regulated, and now the hole in the ozone layer is gradually recovering. Lovelock has also been an outspoken scientist on political and environmental issues for many years. Personally, I think he's made some pretty wild and irresponsible comments that he's later had to back down from. Like, for example, in 2006, when he said that as a result of global warming, billions of us will die, and the few breeding pairs of people that survive will be in the Arctic, where the climate remains tolerable, by the end of the 21st century. All the 80% of people would die by the end of the 21st century. I think both of those, in my view, are fairly ridiculous predictions. And it's kind of ironic that just five years later, he was describing himself as an alarmist and admitting that he'd made a mistake. Climate change will be bad. We'll come on to that in some future episodes. But I don't think it can really be that terrible. Not by 2100. He's basing all of that on the very worst case scenarios, which have since been considered less likely to happen by scientists. The point is that Lovelock may be a genius and a fellow of the Royal Society, but you can take some of his environmental proclamations with a grain of salt. All that said, towards the end of his life, he's changed tack. He essentially now considers climate change and environmental degradation more generally to be an unfixable problem. Quoting from a review in the Torograph of his latest book, A Rough Ride to the Future, quote, Ultimately, he suggests, climate change is down to ignorance, not negligence. But while we do not yet know its exact contours, the process is both extremely serious and probably unfixable. Unlike the solution with CFCs, or chlorofluorocarbons a generation ago, there are too many actors, countries, companies and individual humans, that would need to be cudgelled into self-denial if the status quo were to be retained. Where he differs from the consensus, however, is in suggesting that this might not be such a bad thing. What we're seeing around us, Lovelock argues, may be the large-scale destruction of the planet's ecosystem by rapacious humanity. But it may also be, quote, no more than the constructive chaos that always attends the installation of a new infrastructure. Humanity is already concentrating itself in bigger and bigger cities. So rather than trying to save the Earth or restore some artificial version of a normal climate, why not live comfortable lives in clustered, air-conditioned megacities? This serves ants and termites perfectly well, he argues, as well as the inhabitants of Singapore. End quote. So you can see that, although, as I've mentioned, some of Lovelock's claims should be taken with a grain of salt given his past record, there is a tendency here to pivot from it's not a problem, we don't need to do anything about it, directly to it's unsolvable, it's unfixable, we'll just have to live with it. And I think this is a tendency that's incredibly frustrating for environmentalists and people who are involved in the fight against climate change and biodiversity loss. And it may well be possible for us to eventually come to some sort of artificial technological equilibrium. But I always think about Genghis Khan at times like this. In recent years, people have started to reassess the historical legacy of Genghis Khan. And they're saying, 
While he's often viewed as a sort of rampant, rapacious killer of many who uh, engaged in wars that indiscriminately killed civilians, you can argue that this was part of the destructive chaos that attended the installation of a new infrastructure. So perhaps, in the very, very long term, you can argue that by upturning the old infrastructure and replacing it with something new, Genghis Khan laid the seeds, the foundation for change. And that change was ultimately positive, and that's how you reassess his legacy. But think about what this means in a human context, if we're saying that catastrophic climate change is going to be like a Genghis Khan figure, killing millions or even billions, but gradually laying the framework for a, a better species to come in the future. Well, don't you think we would rather have a slow, adiabatic change? A change that doesn't involve millions upon millions of deaths in a catastrophe? Don't you think we should be smart enough not to need a Genghis Khan to change how we interact with the environment and the climate? Because the thing is, while Genghis Khan may, in the long run, have laid foundations for new civilizations to grow, it'd be very difficult to tell that to one of the skulls in the piles of skulls that he'd leave outside cities as a mark of his vengeance. It's very difficult to explain to them that this is for the, all for the good in the long run. Lovelock is also famous as the originator of the Gaia hypothesis. The mythical Gaia was the Greek goddess of the earth, or, or Mother Earth, and the ancients personified the earth as a single living organism. So the idea of Lovelock's Gaia hypothesis is that the earth is, in many ways, a single living organism, with organisms interacting with their surroundings to form a complex, self-regulating system that maintains the conditions that make life favourable. So, it's weird. The system is in equilibrium. It's in a symbiotic relationship with the life that's on it. Life regulates the earth, and the earth regulates life in such a way that there's a stable equilibrium between the two of them. And in some ways it makes sense that natural selection would select for creatures that can subtly change their surroundings, allowing a greater range of conditions to be suitable for life. Global temperature, oxygen levels, liquid water, and the salinity of the oceans may all be, in some sense, maintained and regulated by organisms within tolerable levels for those organisms to survive. That's the idea, anyway. You might think of the idea as Mother Nature as an actual force in the world as slightly too Peter, Paul and Mary, and you may be right. Now, I stand with a lot of other scientists in arguing that there's really not enough evidence to believe in the Gaia hypothesis as it's formulated. I think it goes way too far, because what you need is these biological feedback mechanisms. You need some way for, to demonstrate that the biology is regulating the climate and regulating the environment in a really big way. You need to show that they're strong. And I feel like if they were strong enough to genuinely be the deciding factor in the environmental conditions, we'd be able to talk about them. We'd be able to say how the dominant factor in, e.g. the Earth's temperature, is some form of life or another. And that doesn't seem to be the case. But at the same time, we evolved to live on this Earth alongside other creatures. There are intricate and complex links between the species that exist on this planet. Consider this, though. The creator of the Gaia Hypothesis, who came up with it in the 1970s. In 2017, he's essentially saying that our destiny is to kill Gaia, to replace Gaia with an artificial life support system, rather than the natural one that has sustained us throughout our history. Perhaps this can happen. Perhaps, even inevitably, it will happen. There are two different worlds when you're talking about environmental issues. The world of things that humans can and should do, and the world of things that humans actually end up doing, which is driven by self-interest. There's enough food in the world to feed us all, but guess what? Millions of people will still starve to death this year. I'm not innocent in this. I benefit from a rich, by many standards, decadent lifestyle, a lifestyle of waste, consumption and destruction compared to many, just like many of the people listening here. So it's not ridiculous to think that if we can't even equitably feed ourselves, we will not be able to save the environment, not in a way that's justice for all, and we will have to replace it with some artificial life support system, that the whole world will become some bizarre, engineered, high-tech super city, with food grown in its labs or by artificial photosynthesis, and water purified from the oceans so that it's safe to drink. It's possible that this can happen. 
But if Lovelock is at long last correct, we are witnessing the transition from being a species that depends on the natural environment to survive, to one that entirely replaces it in our own image, in our own making, then I really don't think it's obvious that this transition will go smoothly. I think there will be blood. And if we're not incredibly careful, it won't just be the end of the world as we know it for millions of other species. Homo sapiens could be amongst those who fall from grace. Unthinkable, right? There used to be billions of passenger pigeons as well. Thanks for listening. If you have enjoyed the uh, unmitigated depression of this, there are plenty of things you can do to take action on the climate, on biodiversity, plenty of charities. I'll put a list of those in the show notes. In the meantime, you can visit us on Twitter at PhysicsPod. You can visit our website on www.physicspodcast.com. Please leave reviews and ratings on iTunes. Tell your friends about the impending calamity of the end of the world, or how maybe it won't all be so bad. And next episode, we'll be continuing with this wonderfully cheerful theme by talking about climate change. See you then. You better make some preparations. There's no time for hesitations. Compile a list of tips. Our theme music is Get Ready for the Apocalypse by Astrometrics. Do get ready.